Good afternoon. Um, many thanks for the invitation. This is my third time in Ireland, and um, hopefully if this talk goes well, I'd love to come back. So I was asked to speak about community engagement, and it's fair to say it sounds a bit fluffy, if you ask me. Engagement, non-specific. And I'm here to try and help us realize that, no, it needs to be more strategic and systematic. OK, so today we're going to explore more about what community engagement means in this context, list some opportunities, and certainly we know some challenges, and then provide some recommendations, and this aligns with policy, about developing more compassionate and equitable opportunities for people living with serious illness, caring for, for those recently bereaved and experiencing grief. So as I say, community engagement needs to be active and systematic. So we just explore those two words, active. You've got to do something. And systematic means that you're structured in your approach to this. It's about civic engagement. And as we've understood from this morning, it's all about collaborative partnerships. Now, I work in, um, with NHS England, and we've moved to this idea of an integrated care system. What it's trying to do, if you, if you read the rhetoric, they're trying to squash hierarchies and give an equal voice to a charitable sector as well as a statutory sector. It works well on paper, less well in practice because of history. But I guess as we move forward, that is the ambition, that we're going for more of a horizontal approach the NHS for decades worked with hierarchies. It's going to take time. And then, of course, we've got the focal importance of local knowledge. The way that research and certainly NHS evidence works is that you start off in a small population, you try something a little bit bigger, you try and scale it up and spread it. But it's not a recipe. Yeah? Just because it works over there, you can't pick it up and parachute it over there. That's not how it works. So we also need to acknowledge that the way that we're working goes against some of the traditional medical model of how we identify and value evidence. So I got some government funding and I worked, um, studied that 10 and a half million pounds had gone into to English uh, care homes and, and they're all randomized control trials and they all showed neutral findings and I, and I showed in the review is that those interventions didn't necessarily not work it's the way we went about the study so my paper was essentially entitled did the trial kill the intervention so from here on in we need to find you know appreciate that the way that we've tried to track and gather um, outcomes and data needs to change how we value the information needs to change. The metrics, yeah? it's not all about quantitative metrics. As we've established, it's more about stories. In this area, we're working with head and heart. So the goal, to create compassionate, inclusive environment where accessible, equitable, and responsive end-of-life care is integrated into the community's way of life. So if anyone's had an opportunity to look at um, Alan's paper, it's called Palliative Care, The New Essentials, this COG model is central. And so I've ended up making it a bit spinny just to show that it needs to be active. But having, by identifying the different areas also is, you know, suggestive of how it needs to be systematic. So what exactly does engagement mean in this area? Are people familiar with this term social capital, right? I think people can understand what it means, but what does it actually mean? We're talking about building social relationships between these sectors, bridging social relationships between these sectors, and linking. Building, bridging, and linking. And all about social relationships. And this is where the systematic element, and the active element, needs to come together. So, in order for a compassionate community to operate in the main, 
you need civic orchestration, you need community involvement, you also need to work with generalist services as well as specialist services. The size of the COGS in this model is also really important. Historically, the blue COG, the smallest COG, has got the lion's share of the money. But actually, what does most work? Civic orchestration. Yeah? Building, bridging, and linking social relationships. It's also important to, to consider that um, nothing goes according to plan. Uh, in, in Dominic's presentation, he talked about emerging. In, in Alison, she talked about evolving. A lot of this stuff we can't, we can't pre-plan. We've got to be open to un unanticipated consequences. There's not going to be a linear relationship like a randomized controlled trial where I do a baseline assessment, I do some work. As long as I control the variables, I can attribute what changed to the intervention. But by focusing on that one outcome in those care home trials, we didn't show a difference in that outcome. To a commissioner, unfortunately, we showed that that intervention didn't necessarily work. But there was loads of good stuff that went on outside of the gaze of that one particular metric. So let's, let's be open to, to tracking all the benefits that could happen. So what I'd say there is a complex system, so complexity science comes into it, but it's adaptive. The relationships you build tomorrow will change consequently what happens in the future. So why? Why is this particularly important in our current context? So we know that end-of-life care is emotional. We know it can be isolating and exhausting. And these can have a significant impact on someone's health. Each person's experience is unique. And the most, and the most, well, the best support that people can receive are from the people that know them best. Yeah? There's a classic Australian study that looked at or like experiences that were perceived as most unhelpful actually came from interacting with services. So if we think about this idea of equipping people and civic orchestration, how are we equipping the people to support the people that are closest to them? And we'll come on to that in a second. Right, the UN every a couple of years uh, publishes a human development report. And the one in 2022 show that after incremental increases, each time access to uh, education, health, etc., everything was moving in the right direction up until the pandemic. And cons consequent years, it's come down. And the title of the report is called Uncertain Times and Unsettled Lives. It acknowledges that post-pandemic war in Ukraine and elsewhere, a climate crisis, a cost of living crisis, it wasn't just one thing. It was just this whole ball of bear this uncertainty complex they talked about. So for us who are trying to promote community engagement, encouraging people to do something new, to do something extra, don't be surprised if there's some resistance. People are, people are fearful for their jobs. We need to show awareness of this. We also have demands on health, health, end of life care services, resource constraints, complexity of the care system. It's difficult to navigate and complexity of care needs, largely attributed to multimorbidity. Oh, so what do we need? The follow-up report to that um, uncertain one is called Breaking Through the Gridlock. What we're after is collective action. We all need to take responsibility. Hopefully that's been a theme from this morning as well. If we're gonna take, if we're gonna move forward, we need to move forward together. So going back to political science, there was an, a Nobel Prize winner called Eleanor Ostrom, and she worked on this idea of social dilemmas, where there was individual interests and also collective interests, and sometimes there's a mismatch. And death and dying for me certainly come into that category. We want to look after our own, but we also acknowledge that we're part of a community, and sometimes those interests don't immediately gel. So she wrote a paper and it was about try to work out the key components of establishing and maintaining collective action. And I don't think you'll be surprised by these key concepts. Trust, reciprocity, and reputation. If we're asking people to do stuff, what's in it for them? 
how is it going to boost, if you're asking an organization, how is it going to boost their organizational profile? But as Alison's talk clearly suggests, first and foremost, it's the trust element. And unfortunately, at the back of the pandemic, trust in organizational systems is at an all-time low. How did it happen? The people that we expected to keep us safe maybe didn't do so as well as we wanted them to. There's distrust. So if anything, as we move forward, we need to think about establishing the trust relationship before we start to do any work. Exactly what Alison suggested. Has anyone heard of the name Marshall Gantz? Okay, right. Please look him up. He's got a fascinating story. He's a professor out in Harvard or something. And he tried to work out what the key ingredients in developing and um, basically, you know, putting it out there around a public narrative and engaging speech. And if you go back to Barack Obama's first speech, he used um, Marshall Gantz's principles. First off, why me? Why us? But crucially, why now? So if you want to tell a story about why people should get more involved with end-of-life care, why are you standing up in front of them? What qualifies you to do it? Why is it important to us as a group? But crucially, why now? And as you can see through this, we've got a relationship between self and now, like motivation and purpose. We've got a relationship between self and us, which is community. And then we've got a relationship between us and now, which is urgency. If you go back to Barack Obama's first speech, you will see how he weaves between all of those to a standing ovation at the end. Now, I'm not going to try anything similar to that. <laughs> but I will use a principle. Why me? So my father died in January 2023, and my father-in-law just shortly before that. Two very, very different experiences. Another Nobel Prize winner, Daniel Kahneman, a behavioral economist, he wrote a book, Thinking Fast and Slow. I must confess, I didn't get to the end of it, right? I tried, but it was a bit much for me. But I'm going to nutshell something I read. He did a study where he, he looked at a surgical procedure, and he grouped two, two groups of participants. Some had a modicum of pain at the start, and then a huge spike at the end. Some people had a spike of pain at the start, and then it sort of mellowed out. It was the same procedure. And when people were asked about their experience, the people that had a spike of pain at the end, loads worse. It's human psychology. Endings matter. So if we're thinking about the people that live on, crucially, or how that person died, how people witness the ending is really, really important. My dad died in France 18 months ago. I got probate last week. I'm in debt up to here, right? Oh yeah, I'll get paid. 18 months of stress. I won't lie to you. There's times where I've cursed him, left it in such a mess, right? Endings matter. Especially with my father-in-law, he died at home with his family around. <sighs> Couldn't be better, right? Two very, very different experiences. Then we think about us. So this is from the Lancet Commission. And it looked at health spend in the last 12 months of life. So as you can see by my arrow, what is going on in that last month? GP appointments and outpatients appointments in that last month, overall health spend. If you want to make significant improvements to end of life care, we need to ask what is going on in that last month. And I know for a fact that some people who are living at home looking after people with long, complex disease, uh, like, uh, yeah, basically conditions like dementia, they could have been looking after someone for, for years, only to hit a crisis point at that last month, usually a change in breathing, not knowing what to expect that may have then related to a transfer to hospital. Family may think, oh my God, is that what they would have wanted? But I think. Why us, in terms of what is going on, especially in that last year, we need to reflect on. And in terms of, there's opportunities there to try and influence change. Why now? So this is English data. A pivotal study published in 2008 from the Cicely Saunders Institute used census data. Obviously, the two certainties in life, death and taxes. They tracked how many people were alive, and they projected when they were expected these people were going to die. Okay? 
And as you can see, this curve has come down and down and down. That was the advances in medical science. So it tracked it from 1974, and where that solid line is 2002, where they stopped tracking it. And then they did the projections in the dotted line. And they projected that it was going to be this uptick around 2010. And from here on in, it's going to be more people dying. So I went to the Office of National Statistics, and their projections are coming true. Very true. Apart from they underestimate. So in terms of data, 580,000 people died in England and Wales last year. And if you were to equate that each death affected five people, that's nearly three million people bereaved in one year. If that's not a public health concern, I don't know what is, right? We don't talk about that. So compassionate communities is about enabling people to generate solutions within their own communities, okay? So think about this idea of equipping people. Those people that are closest to the person, the family who are dying, what do they need to, to deliver the best care? And this is what I mean. So we, we've heard two approaches, a community development approach and a socio-ecological approach. Oops. What we've got here, thinking about the 95% rule, is circles of care, right? We need to think about how we're supporting the people who are in that inner network, typically two to five people. Those are the people that spend most of the time with the person who's dying. And then going out into the outer network. It's not until you get Beyond that, you get to the 5%. So we need to think about, in, in uh, England, we had that um, the ambitions framework, number six, which is uh, ambition six. Each community uh, is prepared to help. What does a community need to feel prepared to help? That's the public health message. And for the, it needs to happen in routine clinical practice. Who is part of your, of your social care network? The Australians have a brilliant app called Gather My Crew, where you can invite people in, into your closed group. And it actively supports that, you know, I've used it in the past. Let me know if there's anything I can do, right? Who said that? Usually doesn't actually equate to something. But if you give something tangible tasks, it can make a huge difference. And then the other approach would be the socio-ecological, and that's using the charter. It's something that we use in East Anglia all the time. We have small groups. We say, well, so what interests you most? Where do you have relationships? Start with what's strong, not with what's wrong, and you can, you can start somewhere, right? And this represents a systematic approach to this. If you guys aren't using the charter, I really, that would be my first recommendation. And then ultimately what we're thinking about, social capital, bridging, building, linking, right? And ultimately it leads to social cohesion, the glue that, that brings it all together. Now, the other person who I think is important, I'm hurrying because Paul has given me the wink, I've got two minutes, um, is uh, Etienne and Bev Wenger. And so we use this term community as a practice, but the way a community of practice is actually established is essential, non-hierarchical. In the NHS, unfortunately, they use it as a meeting with a prettier name. A community of practice is not just another meeting, right? You're there because you want to be there. You're there because you're motivated. But if you put everything into a social learning context, always think about where we're going next. What have we learned? Where are we going next? Historically, it's like there's a fixed, fixed end point. We look back. Did it work? No? Right, we scrap it. There's learning there, right? Build on something. Otherwise, that's tantamount to wastage. And ultimately, networks, when you see those computational models about networks, it's non-hierarchical. The network is only as strong as its links. Otherwise, you've just got individual nodes. So my recommendation also is to use, as Alison was mentioning, use your... your creative media more intelligently to celebrate good stories. And that's the way you get change, where people feel appreciated. And there's a whole school of thought around appreciative inquiry. We don't have to look hard to see bad things. We try and, you know, amplify the good things. 
And put crucially, money can't be the barrier to act. Because let's be frank, we haven't got any. And this would be just one schematic. Talked about that top bit would be having a, a, a core steering group of maybe about eight, eight people at the most. From that, you can have spin-offs where you can bring up um, and invite people to set up smaller groups aligned with the charter. You might have a group that, uh, that works with schools, a group that works with the homeless population. You know, there's, there's no shortage of goodwill. Crucially, in my last slide, what I'd say, what is the first step? Craft an invitation. Now, this is mainly working for the community development approach, but if you have an idea, invite people. You'll find that other people think that your idea is great too. Right? And I'm more than happy to put you in touch with a guy out in Canada who, who delivered the best workshop I've ever experienced. It's called The Art of Invitation. How we can be transparent about what we want and so we can be confident the people that turn up are the right people. Pay special attention to how you gather, how you share power within that dynamic. Make sure that the people who turn up, they have a fair chance to speak if that's, they want, if that's what they want to do. But we essentially, I work as a psychologist and, and many of the things that we uh, observe in, in our societies are, suggest an avoidant behavior around not talking about dying or a phobia showing fear around that. If you were to go to a psychologist as a part of CBT or something, the first line of approach would be exposure. So at a at civic level, how are we enabling and, and providing more exposure to have opportunities to talk about this stuff? Again, for me, it comes back to invitation. We have the spaces to do it. And then lastly, these would be my three recommendations on resources. We've got the textbook, we've got Cormac Russell's connected community around asset-based community development, and also as a more structural one, we've got the Lancet Commission on the value of death, which is open access. Thank you.